Howdy folks, thanks for coming to the talk today. We are going to be talking about how to create successful Magento projects through winning the requirements game. This talk is going to be a little bit more kind of the theory of what creates a successful project or how do I figure out what good requirements are. Um, so, and then we'll, we'll kind of tail off with a few specifics and, and I'll leave you with some next steps from there. So, uh, like Ashley said, I'm Rob Tull. I'm the director of solutions at Classy Llama. We're a long-standing Magento systems integrator, Magento Gold partner, and I, I run our practice that basically develops software requirements, helps people design projects, build estimates. I also do a fair amount of technical sales support. I'm a Magento certified developer, front-end developer, and I also uh, helped Magento develop their solution specialist certification. So I was very honored to be a part of the group that put that together. Uh, just a little bit, a quick summary of, of uh, who I am. I'm a llama. It's a culture thing uh, for us. You can see all the teal blue shirts running around. There's fuzzy llamas in the, in the marketplace hall if you want one to take home for your kids. Uh, I'm definitely a geek. I like video games and, and computer things. I'm happily married and I got uh, two great little boys. So uh, just a little bit on uh, kind of what's my background and why would I be talking about this topic. I've been in, I started out in development roles transitioned through uh, being a project manager and landed on this role of being a business analyst, right? This, this job of helping translate between technical people and business requirements to figure out what, what do we need to do to make a project go really well. Uh, I, I kind of pioneered the business analyst role at Classy Llama. I was pretty young at the time and thought I'd come up with something new and innovative and then discovered, oh, this is standard in the industry. So. A little less creative than I thought, but I've been in the Magento space for over six years, and I've, I've dealt with uh, project re requirements for over a hundred projects, ranging from extensions to full builds to upgrades. So I've seen a lot of stuff, and everything I'm going to be covering today comes from that. So, uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and dive in. And the the first thing that I want to cover that is critical to understand to a, a successful project is that there are a few key principles you need to adopt, and these are things you really kind of need to take into take into your being, right? This, this needs to be kind of who you are and drive how you think because there is, there is no sort of like magical process or list of checkboxes that you're going to be able to go through that will guarantee a successful project. And so the first of those core principles is that between a merchant and an implementer, whether that's developers that you have in-house, whether that's somebody that you have hired to build a site for you, you absolutely have to have a trusting relationship. One of the biggest things that will end up ruining a project is a relationship that isn't built on trust from the beginning, right? A relationship where, where there's some animosity or everybody's kind of questioning what the other side's motives are because every project is going to run into challenges. I guarantee it, right? I promise you no project goes completely smoothly, especially not when you're dealing with software as complex as Magento and you're doing something as closely tied to your business as an e-commerce site. So you really need to trust the people you're working with so that when challenges arise, you believe that they have your best interest at heart and, and, and they're not questioning whether you're trying to take advantage of them. There's no magic formula for this, right? At some level, this is a, a, thing, a thing that you feel. You work it out through conversation, through getting to know people. But if you are thinking about moving forward with an implementer and you don't fundamentally feel like you trust the people that you're about to hire, that's a major red flag, right? Don't do it. Find somebody that you believe you can trust. Make a change if you have to. That's critical. The next thing is it is important when you are designing a project, when you're getting into a project, when you're executing the process, that it have a lot of conversation between you, between the people that you're working with. If, if you go into a process and, and somebody says, well, here's how we're going to figure out what your project is. We want you to fill out you know, this giant form. It's like 100 questions, and, and, and then we'll just use that. Right? We'll do everything via email. The, the problem that you're going to run into is you lose the human factor, right? Text-based communication is devoid of a lot of context. And so you, you will miss cues. You'll miss things about people. Your implementer will miss things about you. And it, I also find that in the course of working on a lot of projects, it's the little things that come out in a conversation that somebody forgot to write down that sometimes end up being the most critical. So make sure that you're willing to, to talk with the people you're working with and you want the people that you're working with to be willing to talk to you. If there's a resistance to having that conversation, be concerned. And then finally, when you are moving forward in a Magento project, you need to be prepared to engage. 
I, I understand, for example, as a merchant, you are running your business, you're busy every day, but this is not the kind of thing that you can take on and that you can run as like, oh, I'll just kind of do that in the back seat, right? If, they, if my implementer gets it right, I don't need to worry about it. You need to plug in, and you need to, you need to plug in across your team, right? If you've got people who run your warehouse, get them involved. If you have customer service people, get them involved. Don't try and run this all through like one guy in IT, right? Because you're, you're, you're asking for, for problems there. Magento site is fundamentally the web representation of your business. So it's important that all of the people in your business be plugged in. And similarly, you want a level of engagement from your implementer. You start working with someone, you can't get updates out of them, they're not talking to you, they don't respond to your emails, right? That's a sign of concern because if you have a good partnership, you have a good trusting relationship, that engagement should be very high. Keep in mind when you do a project like this too, especially as a merchant, it's gonna require a significant level of investment from you. So keep, keep that in mind as well. When you plan this, you need space. You need to allow time. There are things that your implementer will need. There are answers they will need. You need to be there for them if they're going to do a good job delivering for you. So then a few important truths that I, I think you should accept when you're going into a Magento project. These are, these are things that are critical to adopt but, and seem like maybe they're obvious, but not always. And the first is that every project is different. More than once, I've had a merchant tell me, I'm just trying to do the same thing as everybody else. Right? How, hard, how hard can it be? And, and my response is that your business is different from everyone else's. Right? Don't, don't you have a competitive advantage? Right? Surely there's something that you believe that sets you apart from the other guys. That's why you get to be successful. Because a Magento site is a representation of your business, it's also going to be different. And the project to build that site is going to be different. So, so expect that that's true and that those differences are things that need to be figured out and worked through. That's, that way it doesn't catch you off guard. The second thing is that your business process matters. If you come at a, a project and you approach it from the standpoint of I, I have a long list of features, I want feature, 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 and all you've been thinking about is the, you know, all the cool things that you saw on your competitor sites for the last five years, what you're missing is that you need to drive from what you actually do. How do you fulfill an order? How do you get customers? How, do you, how does your customer service operation work? What do the guys do in the warehouse, right? Start by, by, by figuring out what your business processes are. Learn them if you don't know. It's surprising to me sometimes, I'll talk to a merchant, how do you do this or that thing? I have no idea. But again, that Magento site, it's that web representation of your business. So your business process should drive what you do. I like to say that ROI is the best metric for gauging whether a requirement or a need is a good one. Now, to break this down a little bit, what I'm, what I'm really getting at is for anything that you build, try and understand what is the return from that thing going to be. Try, try and gauge that. Try and define that at some level. If I build this thing, what's it going to do for me? How's it going to help my business? How's it going to move things forward? If you can't do that, if you can't figure out what the return on something is, then be cautious of pushing it forward. Right? Cool stuff. It's shiny and we like it. But if it's hard to measure that return, there's a good chance you're going to find your investment wasted. Too much change at the same time is not a good thing. Now, I, I understand that sometimes strategically, you're going to want to maybe change out your website at the same time you change some other systems. Maybe add, adopting Magento unlocks some capabilities in terms of technology that you didn't have before. But be very careful of running through and changing your entire business stack at once. First of all, that's a huge technical burden to take on. Right? This technology stuff is complicated. We do our best to, to boil it down, but you're taking on a lot. So don't add more than you need to. And, and with it being, again, very much a business tied in software project that you're doing, keep in mind that there's a business change management piece to this as well. Your people have to adopt the new things that you do. They have to learn new processes, new ways of doing things. How's my website administration? If you hit them with too much, the problem is that all the knowledge that's been built up in your team over the years is lost. And you're, you're at some level starting from ground zero. To, so to the degree that you can, minimize the amount of change. A website's big enough. And then finally, accept that there are many unknowns in every project. It doesn't matter how good your implementer is. There's stuff they don't know. There's stuff they don't know about your business. There's stuff they, they haven't done before, right? It, it'll, it'll help you just kind of from, from, from a, a position standpoint if you say, I accept there are things that are unknown that we're going to figure out as we go. It helps reduce the frustration and the friction when those things crop up because they will, 
And so then you can say, all right, I knew there was going to be unknown stuff. How do we deal with it? How do we, how do we plan around it? How do we move forward? So having gone through these principles and, and some key things that we should accept, the next thing that I, I want to talk about is what is a good approach? How do, how, how do you structure a project? How do you execute on it in a way that works well? And I'm going to contrast what I'm talking about against uh, what you might call a traditional project. Right? This idea that I'm going to do a big giant discovery phase, I'm going to define pages and pages and pages of documentation, and we're all going to agree, yes, that's what it is. And of course, where I'm going with this is figuring out change. I like to say that e-commerce sites are like doing custom buildings. Right? It's, not, it's not like going to Walmart and buying a widget off the shelf. It's, it's really doing something special. It's tied into your business. And I, I have this really useful example for this because they've been putting in a custom building next to our office the last oh, year or so. It's this spa that they've been building out. And initially it was supposed to be this beautiful two-story building set back into the hill. Uh, but you can see if you look around the back side that uh, the building just kind of wraps around the side. It's not two stories all the way back. And the reason is that they ran into a big surprise when they got started. The rock in that hill was much shallower than they knew when they got in. Uh, the sucky part about that was that we had to live with jackhammering for months. Um, I think my ears are still ringing sometimes uh, because the whole building would shake. But what they ended up having to do was redesign the building. It's not two stories. It's one story that wraps all the way around. It's just two stories in front. And this illustrates a key principle that applies to software projects as well, which is when you get into it, you will uncover things you didn't know. And what's important about that, then, is you need a process that allows you to deal with change. So the process that we want and the way we want to be is we want an agile process, right? Agile meaning I can move quickly. Change is okay. I can adopt change. Now, an agile process means a process for change. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that, that, that there's no structure, right? Agile doesn't mean that we have no process. So if you've, if you've heard a software shop, talk about Agile before, and they said, oh, don't worry about this. We don't define those things. It's Agile. It's flexible. No, that's wrong. Agile doesn't mean there's no process. It just means that we've tried to adopt a way of working that keeps process from becoming this, this ruling beast that causes problems instead of helping us. Agile also doesn't mean that we do no exploration. So with, with Agile, what we don't want to do is, tr is try and define an entire project in minute detail up front. Because this is the, the thing that we've accepted is there are unknowns and that things are going to change. So we, we can't define everything up front because the Magento project is going to take you several months at minimum to implement. But it doesn't mean that we do no exploration either. In a good Agile project, you should have a partner who's digging in, who's figuring things out. Again, a caution. If you work with someone and they're not doing any exploration, they're not asking you questions and you say, why not? Oh, we're Agile. We just build stuff and figure it out. Right? That's, that's a warning sign be concerned. That's something you should be able to expect, is we're, we're still going to get into the requirements. We're still going to figure things out. We're just not trying to pretend that we can lock it all down, since that's a myth. Agile also doesn't mean that you have no accountability. Right? Again, if a company is trying to pass that off as, as we're Agile, you shouldn't expect things or, or just wait. Right? The very opposite should be true. In a good Agile process, you should be getting work in iterations. It should be coming in cycles. It should be coming quickly. If anything, with a good Agile process, you should have a better idea what's happening in your software project that your implementer is doing than if you're in a traditional pro kind of project where you did a ton of documentation, you defined requirements, and now you've got to sit and wait for six months and hope that what comes out at the end is good. So to tie this all up, right? Agile means that we plan for change. We expect things are going to change, and we have a process that is designed to incorporate that change well. Now, one of the key principles to make this work is that you, you have to be agile, right? You really, have to, you really have to take this in. You have to say, I, as a person, as a business leader, in this project process, I expect change. I'm going to roll with change. I'm, I'm going to be flexible. I'm going to under, be understanding. I'm going to work with people to figure things out as they come up. So why that trust is critical. If you don't trust your implementer, you're not going to be able to work through challenges as they arise. So in order to have this flexibility, those principles have to be there. So let's talk about some of the keys for how Agile can be successfully done, some good principles there. And the first is focus on MVP. This is not most valuable player and it's not illusion to Magic Johnson, right? This is, this is minimum viable product is what MVP stands for here. 
And what that means is, when you're looking at your Magento project, you want to get a very clear sense for what are the things I absolutely must have, the stuff that you just could not possibly launch without. And be hard on yourself, because you're going to want to say, I have to have everything. Right? I want all the stuff I've been dreaming about for five years. But try and think through very critically, what are the things I absolutely must have to launch? I've got to be able to take payments, got to calculate shipping, got to list my products. Right? There's some fundamentals that have to be there. You don't have a successful site. But what are they? And then what you want is you want a project where you and your implementer agree that for the budget and timeline you have, you absolutely for darn sure can accomplish your MVP. Now, that should mean that you end up with more room than what you think your MVP will take in your total project. That, that gives you flexibility so that when those unknowns come up, when changes arise, when three months down the road something new happens in your business and you realize you have requirements you didn't have, they fit. Because we started by driving from what your MVP was. But you, this, this is really something where if you're the person defining requirements, if you're the person saying, I as a business stakeholder am getting a project done, you're the one who has to say, okay, what do I really honestly need? Put your wants as secondary. Next key principle is in Agile is that we want to build working software quickly. Right? If you're working with an implementer who has a good Agile process, you should be able to see stuff that they've built rapidly. If somebody says, oh, we're Agile and we're flexible and don't have expectations and you're not seeing anything, that's not Agile. Right? Agile is within weeks I'm showing you software and after that, you know, on a one or two week cycle, I'm showing you more stuff. You're testing it, you're trying it out, you're deciding is this what I need? Because when you see stuff in the real world, that's what gives you the best sense for, is it right? Is this what I was looking for? Does it meet my needs? So you want to be building working software quickly. You want to add features iteratively. Right? This is where we start from MVP. And, and we want to work in an Agile process. You want to work in order of priority. Do the most important things first, and then add stuff over time. Don't try and add it all at once in one like, big shot release add it in cycles. And, and one of the key reasons for this is it allows you to get feedback. If you build a feature, you put it out, you see what you, the people in your business say, you see what your customers say, then you can figure out, was that good? Was that bad? Then you add something else, you see how that did. If you build 50 things at once and you put them all out there and, and it goes sideways, right? Sales are down, people in my office don't like it, you don't necessarily know what broke. So by adding features iteratively, it allows you to measure your investment. It also allows you to, to know how well is stuff going. And tied into that, you want to release stuff early and release it often. Now, I, I understand with a website, right, there's a certain level with e-commerce. We, we can't just like throw out a raw Magento installation, replace what you have today, and say, go. But the key, the, the key point here is be thinking constantly, how early can we be getting something into the market? Can we do a beta launch, right? What, what can we do to get feedback, get feedback from the people in your business, get feedback from your customers, figure out, is what I'm doing working? Is it on point? You won't know that until you get it out in the real world, because before that, it's all theory. There's this set of four graphs that I like to use. They really kind of illustrate the value of Agile, in my opinion. So, so working from uh, the one furthest on your left, visibility. Like I said, you should be with Agile seeing working software rapidly in a cycle. So that means very quickly you have a high degree of visibility into what's happening in your project. With a traditional process, you sat down, you're working with all the designers and the architects, you're writing tons of documents, yay, we all feel good about it. And then a company goes away to build software for months and you have no idea what's going on. Right? Your visibility has dropped completely. And then at the end, they launch it. Now you can see it, but it's not until the very end that you have the chance to see if it's right. So with a good Agile process, your visibility is very high all along the way. Secondly, Agile reduces your risk because visibility is high, because we allow for change, you very quickly find yourself in a position where you can assess and say, yeah, we're going in the right direction or we're not, and you can pivot, right? which keeps you from getting too far into your investment before you discover, whoops, we made a mistake. Your value is also very high. And, and, and to kind of illustrate this, this value one in particular, I'll, I'll, I'll go off for a second on a, on a client's story. We had a sporting goods company that we did a build for that was facing some, some fraud issues around payments couldn't get it sorted out with their current platform. And about three quarters of the way into their build, their payment processor came to them and said, we're shutting you off in two weeks if you don't get this fixed. Fraud rates are too high. You're compromising too many people's cards. Because the value delivery had been very high, because we'd been focused on priority the entire time throughout their project, 
We'd already built most of the stuff they needed. We launched their site that was initially on an 80 some odd day timeline at 60 some days, took care of the payments issues, finished adding the other features later, and we were able to do that, and the client was able to be confident that we could do that because the value delivery had been scaling with the timeline of the project. They weren't sitting there waiting in a vacuum, hoping that at the end it was all good. They'd been seeing stuff on a regular basis. And of course, that makes the final point, which is that in Agile, the flexibility stays very high through the entire time. You don't have to change it at the beginning or your, or your toast, right? You can make changes as we go and everyone expects that, so it's okay. So having laid down some of the, the way we should think about working and some good principles, I wanna talk about how do we create the actual requirements? What should my requirements be in a project? And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about method than specifics here. I like to, to follow what I call the flows. Right? I like to follow the, the business path, starting with the customer's business path around your site. So don't start with, I need this feature and I need that thing on my page. Start with, what does my customer do? How do they find me? Do they find you via organic SEO results? Do they find you via ads on Facebook? Do they find you via some other kind of campaign? Right? How does a customer figure out that you exist and get to your site? Because that will begin to tell you what your requirements should be. Then ask yourself, how do my customers find what they want? They're on my site, they found me, they're in my store. How do I help them find the right product? That'll help you figure out things you need around search. It'll help you figure out things you need around navigation, but ask those questions. How do customers find things in my catalog? And then what affects their purchase decision? Is it price? Is it product images? Is it descriptions? Is it reviews on the page? What are the different things that a customer's gonna look at and decide, you know what, I wanna buy something, I do. And then finally, how do they actually buy it? And I have seen merchants ignore this point. It's easy to sort of fall into this assumption of, yeah, the cart and the checkout, that just works. We need some payments, we need some shipping, but that's no big deal. But really think this through. What does the purchase process look like? Once the customer's decided to give you money, this is the point that you want it to be really easy. So how do they actually buy? And then the backside process, once a customer's placed an order, what happens next? This is where some of the complicated requirements can come out. But think about how do you handle shipping? And I don't mean just rates. How do you, how do you ship stuff? How does that process work? What happens in your warehouse? How do you collect taxes? How do you remit them? How do you collect payments from your customers? What do you do to settle out? those payments as you're going through processing an order? How do you deal with the accounting ramifications? How do you make sure that when you collect those payments that they're secure? But again, thinking from the business process. And then finally, how do you actually fulfill the order? The customer's given you money, now you need to honor that trust they've extended to you by sending them stuff. What does that look like? Now, in a normative scenario, that's probably I put things in a box and I send it out, but maybe you need to send that order to a third party warehouse. Maybe it's a digital, Order. So you need, to, you need to send them an email and you want to confirm that they actually got a download. What does that process look like? And this leads into what I like to call my, my million dollar question. And this question is not good in so much for itself as where this question tends to lead. And it is, what happens when you can't ship the whole order at once? First of all, why does that occur? Why can't you ship the whole order at once? Stuff's back order? Is it out of stock? Right? What happens in that scenario? How do you deal with the payment? The customer's paid you, maybe you have a credit card authorization, you can't ship them stuff, it won't show up for 60 days. What are you gonna do? How are you gonna actually ship it when it arrives? Are you gonna, if, if you have half the goods and not the rest, are you gonna ship the stuff you have? Are you gonna wait for the complete order? Right, this, what you wanna do is take this question, ask it, and keep asking all the questions that come up as you think this through, follow this. Because a lot of times, the things you will figure out by chasing this particular question, what happens when, when it's not simple? They paid, I put it in a box, I sent it, right? That's simple, but what happens when it's not simple? That will often help you figure out the most complicated stuff about integration, about customer communication, about accounting issues, et cetera. So I, I, it's, I've got a document where I have this question and then I, there's probably 20 questions that, that stem off of it and, and really chase this and your business, this will help you a lot. So you've figured out requirements, you've gone through your flows, you know what they should be. How do you put them down? How do we note a good requirement in a way 
that works well. It works well for you as a merchant. You know, it represents what you want. It works for your implementer. Your implementer understands it. And there's this thing that we call a user story. It's particularly popular in software development, kind of the agile world. And a user story is a requirement written in this format. It basically says, as some kind of role, whether that's in your business or that's a customer or, or who knows, so I, I, want, I want it some particular feature and I want it for a particular reason. So maybe as a guy in the warehouse putting stuff in boxes, I want to be able to use a scanner to tag barcodes off my shipping slips so that I don't have to key them in by hand. What this tells your implementer is not just what you're asking for, right? Because if you, if you were to just put this down as a feature, I want barcodes on my packing slips. Your implementer doesn't understand what that barcode is for, how you're gonna use it, whether that means something other system needs to be tied in. But if you say fundamentally, here's who wants something, what they want, and why they want it, your implementer has a better ability now to come alongside you as your partner and say, this is gonna be the best way to help you achieve the thing you're trying to achieve. And don't, it's tempting sometimes to leave off the reason, right? As a person in my business, I want a thing. Make sure you include the why. I want it because. Because it's that why where sometimes, in my practice, for example, I'll come back and say, hey, you told me you wanted this feature because of this particular reason, but given that reason, I think maybe there's a simpler way to do this. If I don't know what the reason is, though, I don't have the ability to do that as your partner. So it's critical that you have that discussion about why you want things. You've defined a bunch of requirements. That's great. We've got them, we've got them written down. How do you go about organizing those? In an agile practice, we use this thing called a backlog. Now, a backlog is a list of everything you want. It's comprehensive. It's not, it's not everything that's going to be in a project, right? But what you do with the backlog is you put anything you can think of in there, and then you organize it by priority. And then the, the practice around running an agile project is that for each cycle that you do, maybe a one or two week cycle, you take the highest priority items off of the backlog that you can do, and you work on those. At the end of the cycle, you, the implementer brings you the stuff they've built, you review it, you decide, is our backlog good? Do we need to make changes? Do we need to adjust priority? And you do that again. You're almost never in a project gonna get through your entire backlog. But because you should be constantly keeping it organized by priority, and that's your job as a merchant, as the person driving the project, to define what those priorities are, at the end of a project, you should have gotten all of the most important stuff done. Right? There's this concept of like a cut line. If you're working with a good agency, they should be able to tell you, for example, here's about how deep into the backlog we think we're going to get for the budget you have and the timeline you've got. Again, you're not going to get the whole thing, but if you have some idea how far your investment will go, you can prioritize and make sure that you get the right stuff. It's, I've asked clients at times in the past, which of your requirements are important? And of course, the universal answer is all of them but it's easier sometimes to understand which of them are more important than others. So this is a really useful way to do that. Of course, as part of organizing your backlog and as part of gauging your investment, you need estimates. For a thing that I've asked for, how much is that gonna cost me? You should be able to understand with any implementer you're working with what the components are of any estimate that they give you and what their process is for arriving at that estimate. Now you need to trust your implementer that when they do estimates, they do them well, Right? If, if you're questioning every number they give you, then you're not letting them fill the role you've hired them to fill. But they should be able to give you a good answer of what an estimate means and how they arrived at it. And that's critical because there are many pieces to finishing every requirement in a software project like this. There's the development time, there's testing, there's probably some project management that goes with that. So when you get a number from your developer or from your implementer, what's in it? What you don't want is you think you know what your estimates are, and then you start getting invoices, and, and you say, well, where are all these numbers coming from? And, oh, well, we had to test all the things we built. Right? You want to know, was that in my estimate to begin with or not? So having gone through some of kind of the principal things, how do we organize stuff, I want to talk about some magenta specifics. So at this point, I'm shifting a little bit out of the theoretical into more of some of the practical stuff that you should keep in mind if you're working on a Magento project. And the first of those things is take advantage of the native features that Magento offers you. There are many times I've had a merchant 
come to me, they've selected Magento, they hire me to do a project, and the next thing I know, they're talking about plugging in this and that and doing XYZ customization, and they're gonna replace everything, practically, that Magento has to offer. Now, you can do that, but there's a lot of value to be gained in the platform by understanding what the native features can do for you and taking advantage of them. Let your vision, your plan, your goals of where you want to go fit the platform you've selected. It's certainly the most cost-effective way to go. And there's also some other advantages in terms of keeping things consistent, keeping things stable, making your upgrades easier. So really take advantage of those native capabilities that Magento has. Make sure you understand what they are. Right? Determine what the key features will be for you, which means you need somebody to walk you through the features that exist. Make sure you understand them. Talk with your implementer about it so they can make sure they know these are the things I'm targeting. These are the things I want. And they can account for that in their process. Finally, understand the benefit that Magento Enterprise has to offer. There's good stuff there, but I've seen more than one merchant after a few years on the enterprise platform come to me talking about, why did I choose that? I'm paying this license fee every year, and when I have a dialogue with them about why they chose enterprise, I very quickly start pointing out, you're using this, you're using that, you're taking advantage of this. They didn't understand that from the get-go. So you want to understand, what does enterprise really give you? Magento can help you answer that question. Your implementer can help you answer that question. And, and really think through, how does this fit with my business? Right? Don't, don't just walk into this blindly. Know what you're doing, how it can help you, and how it's going to help you justify the investment that you're making. Some of my favorites, and I, and I call these out specifically because I see them replaced a lot for arbitrary reasons or ignored. Uh, the first being Magento's product reviews. Magento's got a good, solid system for people writing product reviews. There are extensions that can add even more features to it if you don't like what Magento offers natively or you want more capability. So take advantage of that. In Enterprise, you have this great rule-based product recommendations feature. This is a feature that allows you to define different criteria that will associate products, whether that's products that should be bought together, you know, maybe upsell products that somebody should buy instead of the item they're looking at, with the rule-based relationships, you don't have to manually define all of the different relationships between products. So this is super useful for your marketing team, lets you do really interesting dynamic things. I like this one a lot. In Magento 2, Magento has significantly overhauled the checkout process. It's really nice, much better than Magento 1. Simplifies the process down to only like a couple of steps. The customer doesn't have to decide if they want to create an account until after they've placed the order. It's really solid, so take advantage of that. And then finally, again in the Enterprise Edition, you have the Customer Segments feature. This is something that if you have a marketing team, they'll probably love. It allows you to define criteria to segment your customer base. You can target different segments that you build with advertisements. You can use it as criteria for promotions, etc. This is a great feature. It's admin usable. You can even export the lists it generates for use over in other marketing systems that you have. Really helpful for dissecting the people on your site. Of course, another great advantage of having chosen Magento as your platform is that you have this giant ecosystem of extensions available. Hundreds and hundreds of them for Magento 1 and this rapidly growing catalog for Magento 2. So take advantage of that ecosystem. Figure out what's available first of all. Right, there's a lot there. Spend some time browsing the Magento Marketplace, doing some looking through Google, talking to the people you know. Talk to your implementer. Talk to your developer. What have they seen? What do they think you would like? They're also going to be able to give you feedback on, you know, is an extension a good one to put into your site? Right? And is the quality all the way there? Magento's helping a lot now with the Marketplace. They're actually auditing extensions. They're doing code checks. So this is a lot better than it has been in the past. So you have some confidence that the extensions are good. Get your implementer's perspective on that as well. Right? And keep in mind that extensions can augment Magento's native capabilities. They aren't necessarily just a new thing. And so if you looked at a Magento feature and you're like, well, that's good, but it's only half of what I want, there might be an extension that adds those additional capabilities you need to bring that all the way up to what you need for your business. And then finally, a few specifics that uh, I see as common misses. If you're replatforming, if you're coming from something else to Magento, don't forget your 301 redirects. 
If you rely on organic SEO at all, and you don't 301 redirect your pages, what happens is Google just drops all the rank that you had. If you're here in the room and you didn't do this at one point, I'm sure you can, can share the pain that that causes. Make sure your implementer is aware of this and that your 301 redirects are in place and solid before you launch a new site. Make sure you think about tax calculations early on. This could be simple. Some, some, some states, it's like one statewide rate and you only have to pay taxes on orders that are shipping to the state you're in. It's no big deal, but think about it because sometimes it's not that simple and you wanna make sure that the requirements are in place. Too many times I've seen questions and needs about taxes come up at the last minute and now we're scrambling to find a solution to solve that, right? I, I say sometimes taxes are software requirements written by politicians, so it can be a bit of a mess. Think about it early. Make sure you're thinking about security. Ask your implementer, what do they do to keep your site secure? What do they do to protect your customer's payments data? They should have good answers for that. If you ask them about security and they're, oh yeah, you know, it's fine, we, we protect all the stuff, and they can't give you specifics, that's concerning, right? You're taking customers' information. You're taking their, their credit cards to process payment. Customers are putting their trust in you when they place orders. You wanna make sure you honor that. And also there's a significant liability issue here if you don't get your security ducks in a row, so to speak. So make sure you're thinking about this early. And then just a few notes on hosting. Choose a Magento hosting provider. Choose somebody who focuses on it who optimizes for it, don't, don't try and, and run your Magento site on just any old hosting company out there if they don't have a Magento practice. There's a lot of specifics to hosting Magento well that a hosting company needs to think about. And if you go with any random company out there, there's a good chance that you're missing some optimizations that will cost you in performance, could cost you in scalability, could cost you in reliability. So you don't want that. Pick a good hosting company and make sure that uh, you get the stuff set up right. Make sure you're using Magento's caching and you're using other caching technologies like Varnish or Redis properly. Make sure you have asset compression on. I know I'm getting a little technical here. Talk to, your hosting company should be able to give you these recommendations. Your implementer should be able to give you a list of here's the things we can do that we recommend to tune your hosting environment. But think this one through carefully. Don't make a decision just based on what's the cheapest thing because you will probably come to regret it. Thank you guys very much Thanks for coming. Everybody. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Rob.